Father, thank you so much. You are such a good God. You model it for us. You are the parent who has laid down your life for your family. You have given it all. You, you placed that idea of what is a good mother, what is a good father into our minds. And so we thank you so much. You are such a good God. And Lord, we thank you. What an honor and privilege it is to be a parent. What an honor and privilege it is to be a part of your family. What an honor and privilege it is to lead and to love, to listen and learn during COVID, during this historic time in human history. And you have called us to be parents. There is no greater honor. There is no greater joy. And so I, Lord, I thank you for this privilege to come together, to see each other's faces, to really love each other. I thank you, Lord God. I lift up uh, prayers for our pastor, Pastor Rick and Kay. Thank you so much for their heart. I see their heart. They love, they love our church family so much. And so I thank you for them. I ask for your blessing to pour out on them and on this time as we hear and, and listen to uh, what you are speaking straight to our heart, God. Thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Chris, for that amazing prayer and uplifting um, prayer. Kay, thank you so much. Um, I just cannot tell you what an honor it is to get to do this with you and um, have our families get to hear your heart, um, hear how much you love them. Um, it's just a really privilege to be able to be. I'm thankful for technology that we get to do this. I know a lot of us are just, you know, we are on Zoom all day, but I'm thankful that these families have come on here. They, they are looking for ways for, um, to find joy in this season. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm thrilled for this opportunity. You know, with Irvine North, I haven't gotten to visit you in a while. So it, this is just great to be with you. Um, you know, it's not in person, but I feel like, you know, I see all your faces and um, mm -hmm. fun. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. It's good enough for sure. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I read your book a long time ago. And yes. when I read your book, I was floored because I had never realized that there was a difference between joy and happiness. I just never wasn't growing, growing up that way. I never knew there was a distinction. So I'd love to hear what made you kind of come to that understanding that, hey, there's, there's a difference between these two things and I'd like to have joy in my life. Sure. Well, I think we use them interchangeably. So that's a pretty natural confusion. I think we use the words to mean the same thing, but I really do think they're different. Um, for me, I've lived, some of you, if you've read my book or you've heard me talk, you know that um, I've lived with a low level of depression really my whole life. And it was okay. I got, I mean, I made it through. I didn't, it, I did never just end up like staying in my bed. It didn't really affect my life that much. I just have, you know, a few days every once in a while, which I just, you know, just nothing felt good or was right in the world. And I called it my existential angst and that's okay. I, I figured out it would, it would pass and it did. But then when my youngest son, Matthew, um, he had, you know, he had depression from the time he was seven years old, serious depression. And as he grew older and older and his mental illness um, became more and more severe, happiness clearly just wasn't enough for me. I, there were just some days I didn't know how I could get through them. Um, his struggles were so intense. Um, I felt such sadness and grief. I couldn't, no matter what I did, I couldn't feel like I could help him as much as I wanted to. And I just found myself um, you know, reading the Bible and reading verses where Paul would say, you know, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice or I look at Jesus and he'd say, you know, I'm leaving you my joy. And um, all these passages that talked about joy, like it'd be something I was supposed to have all the time. And Paul would write about like when he was in prison. And, and I just started looking at my own life and thinking, okay, there must be something different between happiness and joy because Jesus and Paul and some of the other apostles, James, they seem to have joy even in the middle of really, really hard times. And I'm in the middle of a really hard time and I don't have any of that. And, and so I, I had to decide for myself, um, if, is this just something that it's kind of like a great idea and um, but it doesn't really work in real life. It's something from the Bible, but it's not really practical. Or is it just for certain people? And I wasn't going to be one of those people. But um, so I got really serious about trying to figure out what's the difference between happiness and joy. Because I knew I had happiness occasionally, but joy seemed to be something that I was supposed to have more of. 
and I didn't. Um, so I think that's kind of what launched me on, mm -hmm. on studying the Bible, um, really looking at what it had to say to see if there was some secret, something that I was missing. And as it turns out, I, I sort of was. Mm -hmm. The secret sauce. <laughs> yeah. but it, wasn't, right? it wasn't like I was, it, it, it you know, as we'll talk about it, it wasn't like, oh, well, now everybody has to try to find the secret. Um, because it's not, it's, it's our birthright. It's, mm. I can tell you that right now, it is our birthright from the Holy Spirit. It is available to every person who knows Jesus. And so it's not like a, a secret that only certain people find it truly is available to all of us. And um, I'm really excited we're talking about it tonight. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, you know, I, I think as just a leader um, at our Irvine North campus and then just, you know, talking with the parents, they need to hear this, that it is a choice, that is their birthright, that, um, and as you're going to share more about how we acquire that, um, I'm excited for them to hear that. Now, as a parent, like I said, I didn't grow up knowing there was a difference. You know, I just, I le learned it on my own and reading your book. So as a parent, what can we do? How can we teach our kids to grasp that concept of, of joy and how to truly attain it. Yeah, well, I think it's, we probably have to get a hold of it ourselves first because it's very difficult to teach our kids something that we don't know or aren't practicing. So I would say it really has to start with um, us as parents, um, understanding what joy is. And then when we begin to understand, begin to live it out, begin to practice it, then it becomes easier to teach our kids because now suddenly they can look at our lives and see us modeling it. Because it's not just something that we want to tell them. This is something that we want to show them by the way mm -hmm. that we live, by the way that we respond to the difficulties or the struggles or the frustrations or um, the hard times that, that we're going through. And COVID-19 certainly provides us daily opportunities to put joy into practice. And, and joy is, um, I think the simplest way I could say it, it's, it really has nothing to do with going, what's going on around me. It has nothing to do with the externals. And, and it, it has to do with the eternal, which is, which is God. And so when we're going to teach our kids about joy, we have to have settled that in our own hearts, that we're not looking to the people in our lives, which is what all of us do. We always look at, if we're married, we look at our, at our spouses, or if we're in close friendships, we look at our friends or our roommates, or we expect our kids to help us, you know, that they're supposed to provide joy for us, or we can't look for it in people because people will always it's inevitable. Our, our husbands, our wives will disappoint us. Our, they're not going to be there for us at every moment that we really need encouragement or support. Our kids, especially when they're young, you know, they're not going to walk around going, thank you for being my mommy. You know, <laughs> you're the best mommy. And you're saying, clean up your room, put your dishes away. And we know that's helping them shake their character, but they're not going to go, thank you for making me clean my room. You know, and so you just, you can't, you're, you cannot look for joy in people. Can't look for it in the things that we possess, our houses, um, our clothes, our possessions. Um, none of that is, is permanent. It can all, that can all be lost. So if our joy is in a possession that could break or that could wear out, or um, maybe we like, the, we like the way the kitchen is in, in this place that we live, but now we live over here and it's not as good. And so now we're not feeling as joyful. I mean, it's, it's temporary. It's, 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 it has nothing to do with anything that lasts. We, we sometimes put our joy in, in our personality. You know, if we're extroverted or we're just those people that are always happy, pappy, you know, happy, peppy, slappy, clappy kind of people. Um, you know, they're just some people we, and we call that joy. Well, it might be, but it might just be that's their personality. People who are introverted, people who are quiet, people who um, are a little more sober about things can still experience joy. So it's not about our personalities. It's not about um, how much money we have. It's not about um, the position that we have at work. It's, it, is, it is only about a person um, who can never change, and that's God. Mm -hmm. And once we really begin to settle in, look, he's not going anywhere. We're part of an unshakable kingdom. Literally everything around us can and will be shaken, but he remains. And when, when he becomes the source of our joy, 
um, when he becomes um, the reason to get up in the morning, even on the bad days, even on the crummy days, even on the blah days, he doesn't change. I struggle his, I do not have this mastered. I am not in any way sitting here as though I have got this perfected. I'm on a journey. I'm on a journey um, of, of choosing joy every day. I have to preach this to myself for the same reasons you have to preach it to yourself. But, but as we begin to grow in it, and then we begin to teach that to our kids, that joy is not about necessarily happy feelings, but it's that sense in your heart that everything is okay today. Even if it's not okay, inside of me, it's still okay. And that's based on a, a certainty that God is in control and that he's good and he can be trusted. Um, I think it's really important once you get that definition um, for yourself and for your children and you're mod starting to model that, is that, that we teach um, them and remind each other that we get to choose the amount of joy that we experience every day. That's hard. I don't like that. I wish that I could say, well, if, if, if all these circumstances would line up okay in my life, then I can experience joy. Or if, if, um, if Rick and I are getting, getting along just perfectly, then I can experience joy. Or if I got to go out today in the grocery store and wasn't worried that I was going to run into 10 people without wearing masks and I was going to get exposed to something that I can feel joy. No, it's, it is, it, it totally has to do with my decisions to believe that God is good, that he can be trusted, that even though this is hard or that is hard, or this isn't turning out the way I expected, he remains madly in love with me. He is good to me. His character is trustworthy. And we will get through this, whatever this is on any particular day. And so to teach your kids and to remind yourself um, that as everything else around them changes, their friends change, you know, they've started a new school year and maybe they have totally different kids in their class than they did last year. And they're bummed because, um, because they really liked some of their friends that were, and they're not in there this year. And they could just say, well, this whole year is going to be terrible then. And to be able to teach them, no, even in this, God is here and God has something good here and, and we can still believe him and choose joy. And so I think getting the definition, um, making sure that we're not placing our, our very fragile hopes for joy in things that change, things that can be taken, things that, that we can lose in people that can die or leave us or move away or get sick. I mean, not in how much money we have or where we live, um, what our job is, but, but in, in that person of Jesus who cannot change. Um, and then began to recognize, I get to choose today. At the end of this day, I experienced as much joy, not happiness, not giddy, happy feelings per se, but a deep sense of peace in my heart that I can have every day and I have to choose it and to tell that to our kids. And then begin to model that as they see us day in and day out, choosing joy or not choosing joy, um, that will begin to teach them also um, the difference between happiness and, and joy. That is so oh, yeah. true. No, I, I, was, I was tearing up because I was thinking, you know, when you spoke about uh, we can't find our, our joy and happiness in people or our marriage or our relationships because that could almost save a marriage right there. You yeah. know, you can't find, you can't find that in your spouse, no. you know? And so I just, that was so powerful what you spoke. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, um, like you said, part of choosing joy is, you know, connecting with others and supporting one another. And during this pandemic right now, you know, so many out there, as you know, on this, on the Zoom call as well, they're feeling so alone. Some of our, some of our parents have, have been um, sheltered since before we had shut down. So they shut down before we had shut down. So they're just so isolated and, you know, they're going through job loss, health loss, financial loss um, without their normal traditional support system. You know, they're, they're not going to their friend's house and whatnot. So, you know, some people struggle with like opening up. We're being so authentic right now. You're always authentic. You're always sharing, you know, your struggles. And that's what's teaching us. How can, how do we help others open themselves up as well and be vulnerable so that they can know they're not alone? 
Yeah. Um, well, if there was ever a time, as, as you pointed out, um, that is sort of tailor-made for isolation, it's right now. Um, especially in the earlier days, earlier months of the pandemic. Um, here in California, as we're just starting to move into um, probably the, the best that we've been in, in months in terms of the, the, um, the COVID um, uh, infections and hospitalizations and deaths. And, and our state has moved into the red zone. And, and um, to me, the red zone sounds bad, but evidently the red zone's a good thing right now. And uh, it means that, that things are starting to unlock a little bit. So we're, Hopefully, I mean, it feels realistic to think that if we continue on that trajectory, that we that some of those restrictions are going to keep, you know, loosening, and we're going to have even more opportunities to connect in person. But in these months, where I mean, Rick and I stayed in house partly because of our age. Um, we're 66, both of us, so we were like from day one, we were already in the high risk, risk group just by virtue of our age. And then, you know, if you've been around a long time, you know that Rick can get pneumonia pretty easily. He's he's he gets pneumonia pretty easily. So those things made us decide we had to stay in. We had to really, really hunker down in our house. And I don't think we left the house for the first, I don't know, 70 days or something. I mean, it was awful. It was just awful. And, and so I can identify with, with that sense of, of, of being isolated and, um, and how that can wear on you and kind of wear you down. And if you also are, you know, moms with, with children who are also following those same kind of lockdown and not able to be out, it's just a tough time. There's no two ways about it. It's rough. So we have to consciously push back against the, um, the natural inclination maybe to, to isolate um, or to um, just kind of give up and just think, okay, well, I, I have to be isolated. So, so I'm not going to make those phone calls and I'm not going to text and I'm not going to do this when actually this is the time that we have to take those reserves. And maybe you don't have a lot of reserves. Maybe you're already weary. Maybe you came into COVID-19 already a little bit weary and beaten down because of um, your life circumstances. And, um, and now you've had all these months of this but this is, this is our time to be able to push back. Maybe this is the time to join a CR online group. Maybe this is the time for you to take that step of really sharing what's going on inside of you in, in, a, in a CR online group. There's some mental health groups. There's some mom support groups. You know, They may not all be through our church, but there's some good ones out there. And this is the time to resist that inclination to stay isolated but to really connect with people we have to get super creative about it we've all gotten i mean the stories are pretty amazing of the ways that people have gotten creative in connecting and um and staying um as close to people as they can it's not always fun but this is where we are and um this is um we need to come out of this time connected and that will take intentionality and um, so I encourage any of you who are feeling like, I just, I don't even know how to do this. Get as creative as you can be. Take advantage of, of free webinars. Take advantage of free seminars online. There's so much stuff out there. Um, this could be an entire education for you um, and, and connect with people. It's tough. I, I can't, I just can't sugarcoat it and say that, oh, if you do this, you're going to be fine. It's hard. It's really hard. Right. And I, I find that when I talk to people who are really having a, a struggle, they aren't um, either in a small group or they're not connected somehow, you know, and so I really praying that this ministry of this parent connect group will help those those parents um, get connected. Because like you said, like now's the time, like it's not easy. You can't sugarcoat it. You got to go on Zoom or figure out ways to get creative, but we have to. And I think when when we are back together, we're going to know each other so much more intimately than we ever did um, at our campus. So thank you for that, Kay. Um, sometimes as parents, you know, do you think that we do stuff to sabotage truly uh, feeling that joy? Like I know for me, social media, if I'm looking on social media and I'm comparing myself as a mom, I feel like that's like sabotaging myself and I'm, you know, out there doing other things that I shouldn't be doing. What do you think about that? Oh, I think we're all susceptible to that. Um, I don't, I, I mean, there are a couple of people I've had to stop following <laughs> because I got depressed when I would get off looking at their posts on Instagram. It's like they're 
continual vacation. And I'm like, hello, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. How can you be on continual vacation? This is, this is, this is not right. This is, how come you get to do that? And, and, you know, and so it just, I think it's, it can stir up so easily that competition. It's not just teenage girls who get caught in the trap of social media and the comparison. I think that we would probably all be much better off if we severely limited social media. Um, and I'm not just talking about for our kids, I'm talking about for all of us. We were not really meant to live our lives with somebody else's life in front of our faces um, in, in such a way. It's not even just like your name. It used to be it was your neighbors, you know, that we would get competitive with because they were the ones you could see every day. But now it's like the whole world is your neighbor in that sense. And so you can be competitive with people on the other side of the country, other side of the world can make you feel bad about yourself. And um, that will definitely kill joy in us. Um, I also think perfectionism I, I am, you know, I don't know if any of you have studied the Enneagram, but I love the Enneagram. One of the, um, it's just one of the ways of classif classifying personalities and the particular number that I am on the, on, in the Enneagram system is a perfectionist and goodness gracious, I kill joy in myself and other people all the time if I'm not careful because I am constantly looking for perfection. I can always find something that can, a way that that can be made better, how that can be done differently, how I could do things differently, how you could do things differently. And I'm happy to tell you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and nothing kills joy in ourselves and others than that constant um, correction or constant looking for perfection. Believe me, again, I am talking to myself here. I do not have this mastered, but I am, I am working toward um, serenity rather than perfectionism because it will definitely kill joy being um really worried and anxious kills joy um if you are not able to sleep at night i mean your heart you know you're just man you're just breathing it's just this shallow breathing you're just constantly kind of hyper vigilant of what's going to happen or what's next or what what will this what happens if this happens or, or you're, you're catastrophizing you can't feel joyful in those kind of circumstances either. So I think, you know, worry and fear, perfectionism, comparison. Um, let's just talk for a second about um, there's some people that might have some mental health challenges. You're living with depression, um, you know, a, a, a clinical, a diagnosable um, mental health challenge of depression or anxiety. It's, it's kind of like off the charts. It's, it's not, everybody feels anxious. Sometimes everybody feels sad. Everybody feels depressed. Sometimes everybody feels X, Y, Z because we're humans and those are part of our emotions. But sometimes they get to that place that they start interfering with your daily life and you're functioning and you, you're having trouble doing life. You're having trouble doing your parenting. You're having trouble doing your relationship, your marriage. You're having trouble doing your job. I mean, everything, when it gets like to that place, that's the time to say, put up your hand and say, man, I need some help. And, and go talk to your doctor, make an appointment, um, get some blood work, get yourself checked out. Because when there are mental health challenges, that can really affect joy. And you might tend to think, oh, I'm just not spiritual enough. That's what's the matter with me. And actually, you, you might actually have, you know, something that, that you need to um, have a doctor talk, you know, work with you about. So don't be so hard on yourself on some of that. But those are some things I think that I've, I've found that can kill joy in, in me. And I can then kill joy in others when I behave in some of those ways. Right. Yeah. No, I love, I love um, that, you, you know, you're saying when you have those feelings to go get checked out. And, and I love that you compared that. Like, it doesn't mean you're not spiritually mature. <laughs> you know, it just mental health is real and it's unrelated can be totally. completely unrelated. Yeah. Thank I mean, you for I just, acknowledging just, that. I'm so glad you said that. I mean, I'm glad you took that a little bit further because I'm thinking of the apostle Paul, um, where he, he talks about that. There was a point in which, um, talks about in first Corinthians where he, he said, I, uh, second Corinthians, he said, I despaired of life. I was, we, what happened to us was so hard. It was so dark. It was so difficult. He said that I despaired even of life. Well, if somebody who wrote, you know, a good chunk of the New Testament can say, I was at a place emotionally where I wasn't even sure I wanted to keep living. I wasn't sure I could. Then the rest of us need to understand that you can be very close to God can be in the word of God. You can be praying. You can be as mature spiritually as you know, and still experience um, a mental health challenge that is unrelated 
to, um, you know, your, how close you are, how spiritual you are. Um, that's a, that's a myth that I think we, we really need to dispel. That's awesome. Yes. That's so good to hear from you saying that yourself. Um, that's so powerful. Thank you. Um, I, I've heard you talk about how control, and you kind of said also like how being, um, you know, your super A personality, you want to have things in a certain way. Tell me about how that can relate to joy when you're, you're trying to control everything. But right now, like, I literally don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I feel like our parents are, are we going to school the 22nd? Or are we not going to school? Are we doing hybrid? Are we not? You know, nothing is able to be controlled right now. Yeah, it's not. And um, probably, I mean, in my lifetime, it feels like that this is the most out of control that the whole world has felt. Um, I, I just don't remember another time in which it really feels like the whole world is on fire. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and when it feels like the whole world is on fire, it can, it can, as you say, just lead us to, we don't know when we're going back to work. We don't know um, if we're gonna be going back to school. Maybe we'll go back to school for a week and then maybe they have the caseloads go up and they t the kids have to go back home. Or maybe they decide, no, we're shutting down the restaurants and maybe you work in a restaurant and now you can no longer work in the restaurant because you're not, you gotta go back. I mean, it is, it's just, it, it can, it can just drive you batty. It, it can just make you wanna pull your hair out or make you just maybe, maybe I'll tell you what I, I am hearing from people is, um, people who have maybe in the past struggled with drinking too much or um, have maybe they're on prescription medication for a, a chronic condition. And, and there's just, it's like this feeling of overwhelming, maybe taking too much or maybe using or um, smoking marijuana. I mean, honestly, there's all sorts of ways shopping too much. It's easy to shop too much when you're sitting at home in front of the computer. It's very easy to do that. So you're spending money really have maybe you're drinking too much maybe there's maybe um maybe you're watching porn maybe you, there's all kinds of things that we do when we're feeling super stressed and everything feels out of control maybe you're not eating enough you know that's something you can control or maybe you're eating too much and food is just this uber comfort to you because everything else is out of control so i just feel like all of this is like the devil's playground he's just running amok in in our lives if we let him and and that sense of um things being out of control what we what we must do is we have to bring that back to the truth and the truth as god has has revealed himself in his word is he is in control you can't read the the old testament i'm reading through the old testament right now i've just finished isaiah and i'm in jeremiah right now and and just verse after verse god says i do this and i do this and i do this and i do this and the nations do this but i'm doing this god is in control and what feels absolutely out of our control is not out of his control and when our minds spin and we're just kind of like spun out inside by everything that is not in our control, that's not the time to double down and be the super controller in your family. That's not the time to clean every closet and every piece of dust has to be off the floor. It's not the time to say, well, fooey on it all because it's all out of control and let your house then go wild either. It's, it's, um, it's coming back to the truth. God is in control. I need to control what I can control because that's my responsibility. But all those things that are out of my control, I have to relax and leave them in the hands of a God who is in control. Um, there's, um, I like the Lord of the Rings um, books. I love the movies. They're just some of my favorites. I know not, ever, not a lot of women like those, but I'm crazy about them. And um, there's this one part, just the basic storyline is this guy Frodo, this little hobbit has to take this evil ring gold ring back and throw it into this lake where it was created. And this ring, because it's evil, becomes a burden that's so hard for him to carry because it, it's, it just emanates evil. And he's becoming weaker and weaker as he carries this, this burden of this ring. And he says to one of the other main characters, a wizard named Gandalf, he says, I wish these times had not come to us. Mm -hmm. And the wizard Gandalf looks at him and says, so do all for whom these times come. But all that we must do is decide what to do with the times that we've been given. 
And so we didn't ask to be born in the time when COVID-19 was raging through our world. We didn't ask to be born in this time, in this point in history. God could have let us be born in the future. He could have let us been born in the past, but he didn't. He let us be born now. And so these times are the times we've been given. There's a lot about them that are, that's difficult and I don't like. that have been hard. They've been frustrating. Some of you are really, you're struggling. And you're wishing that this would just all be over and that we could either go back to the way things were or we'll just get on with the next. All I know is that these are the times we've been given. And so if these are the times that we've been given, we have to make a decision what we're going to do with these times. How are we going to be better, stronger? How are we going to be more firmly established in our faith life with God? How are we going to be more connected to each other? Um, those are decisions that we get to make with the times that we have been given. I love that. I, I love um, your analogy with Frodo. <laughs> it's such a great visual of, of that burden and how much it carries on us. Thank you for that. Um, just a fun little thing. We've got lots of parents on here with lots of different ages of kids. What's one advice or any kind of advice you would give for moms with little kids right now? They're trying to school. They're trying to, some of them are working. I don't even, I honestly don't know how they're doing it. Just lots of prayer. Um, what it, advice it, would you give? You know, one of the, um, something that I've, I've actually had a lot of fun with this during COVID-19 <laughs> is learning about the brain, which may not sound particularly fun, but however, I really think it is because, um, because it's been so cool to understand what our brains are doing in this time of stress. And so for moms um, with little kids to be able to understand that they, they talk about how we have an, a downstairs brain and we have an upstairs brain. And then our downstairs brain is where we feel like sometimes we just wanna, we're just, we get scared and we run or we get mad and we hit or we throw things or we throw a tantrum because we're frustrated and we're, we're tired of sitting in front of this stupid computer with Zoom and school isn't fun. And, and, and our downstairs brain gets, you know, kind of like all agitated and, or about that. And our upstairs brain is the part that's creative and logical and can think clearly. And so to be able to just, there's some amazing visuals that can teach your littles about their brain and be able to talk to them and talk to them about their emotions. This is a perfect time to teach kids, you know, either using emojis or, um, um, or um, you, know, you know, faces that say, so what do you think, what is this person feeling and by they looking at a face? So that they start to be able to identify not only other people's emotions, which creates empathy, but also identify their own emotions and give them words to, to describe what it is they're feeling and to even teach them something like, so is it a, um, you're feeling angry right now. Is it like big anger or is it just like a little bitty anger? And even for kids to be able to understand the difference that emotions, like the word anger, maybe you've taught them the word anger and they can pick out an angry face on an emoji, but anger comes in, in different forms. Like I said, it can be really big. And we've got to, we need to figure out what to do with that. Or you're more just feeling like, oh, yeah, I'm just, I'm a little bit angry and I can get over that pretty fast. So teaching kids about their emotions during this time, I think is a really powerful thing. We, at, um, you can go to my website at kwarren.com and watch some of the, um, they're called the Hope for Mental Health Community that we do once a month. And we just did one a couple of weeks ago with Dr. Um, Carrie Call from um, Texas Christian University. And she went through this whole, it was like perfect for people, for parents doing school at home or the hybrid and just how to do it, how to survive yourself, how to help your kids with, um, it, it's like this in a box, um, um, some, some lessons, some information. So I really highly recommend that. And um, um, also there's something called um, resources for COVID-19 that another organization has put together. Man, it is just simple things that you can do every day in your home during COVID-19 to create connection, to create um, peacefulness in your home, to bring back some of that sense of control. When kids have routine and rhythm and predictability, they will do much, much better. And who's responsible for creating rhythm, routine, and predictability? the moms and the dads. <laughs> so um, it's not going to be up to the kids to create it. We need to cre help create that for them. But those are some amazing resources that, that I think parents of younger kids are going to really love and find super practical. 
That's great. I think um, sometimes as parents, we can overlook that our kids have emotions and that they're feeling things right now. And I think that is also another way, as you said, to, you know, understand what they are and also how we can have joy in, you know, the, the anger and the frustration. Yeah. And then for our, us with older kids, you know, I have teenagers, how do we help them understand, you know, what's going on right now? Like, do you have any advice for us? Well, similar, the brain stuff is, per everybody in the family needs to understand how the brain works. When Rick and I looked at some of, um, some of this material, we just kind of looked at each other and said, well, where has this information been? The 45 years we've been married, we would have had a lot, a lot easier time if we'd understand how our brains were working. I mean, it's really simple. It sounds really complex, but it's very simple and it has such practical applications. So teach your other kids this too. But um, I'll tell you this. When I have talked to teenagers, and we did a study, we did a survey a few years ago of the, um, I think, middle school and high schoolers at, at Saddleback, and the number one complaint that the kids had then, let alone even now, is my parents don't have time for me. My parents are too preoccupied with their own lives. They are too occupied with social media. They are too busy to listen to me or be engaged in my life. And that was like a knife in my heart um, because I, I would guarantee you that every person who is watching this right now has is their desire to be a good parent. I mean, nobody ever sets out to be a bad parent or not good parent. I mean, we all want to be good parents. And so to know that some of our kids are saying, my parents are too busy for me. They're too busy for me. They're too preoccupied with their own concerns, with their own lives to really engage with mine. So I would tell you parents, particularly of teens, dive in, dive in, show up, be there, make sure that you're having dinner together. It's easier maybe right now during COVID than when life gets back to normal. Um, but let me just tell you one of the most healthy things, the most protective factor you can build in around your teenagers is, um, one meal, at least one meal a day with your, with your student. Um, if you can do dinner, dinner is usually a really good one, but one meal a day, if you could just make that, uh, we're not missing, we're going to eat that. That ha is built in a protective factor. And, you know, I think a lot of parents are worried that their kids aren't going to do as well in school, both younger kids and um, teenagers. They're worried, you know, like, Hey, I'm not, I may not be a great teacher. What if I can't teach my child well? What if they get behind? Because I'm not very good at this. What if I don't do it right? What if they aren't paying as much attention? What if, you know, all the what ifs that they're not going to be as great a student. But let me tell you this. Your kid can always learn algebra. But if your kid comes through this time less connected to you than, than, they, than they need to be, you can't make up for that. You, you genuinely can't make up for that. So the school, the education, the knowledge, all of that is, can be remedial. I'm serious, it can. But if they come out of this more connected to you, and more connected to God, they're gonna be fine. They're gonna be okay. Because ultimately it's not what education that we have at any particular moment in time that shapes us and makes us a well-rounded, happy, joyful person. It is the connections, the deep connections that we have to each other that carry us through. Listen, this isn't the only hard time your kids are ever going to go through. This is not the only challenge your kids are ever going to face. If you build tools into them now, this will help them in the next hard time in their lives, no matter when it is. If you teach them connection, you model connection, you stay connected deeply then it gives them the skills to go through whatever their next crisis is, knowing don't do it in isolation. You don't do it with panic. You do it with believing God is with us. He's in control. You do it connected to the people in your lives. And you trust that our good God is still at work. He's still at work. And we're going to be okay. Like gold. <laughs> Your words are truly gold. I'm, I'm just thinking of just myself as a parent and thinking, you know, we've established the, the nightly dinner. We have 
our kids are older now, so they've got jobs and one's going to college. And so Sunday night, there's no excuse. You are home for dinner, period. And, you know, I think that is so valuable doing that at least a meal as often as you can, setting those rituals, boundaries with your family. Rituals. Yes. Rit um, so rituals, good. rhythm, predictability. Um, 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 uh, what are the other things I said? I was saying, oh, d yeah, depend yeah, dependability, um, uh, scheduling, all of those things um, are, are things that help regulate us in mm -hmm. such dysregulated times. Yes. And I think, you know, parents right now are, are realizing that, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm really the main discipler of my kids right now, you know, because we're not doing the weekend church um, in a traditional fashion. But I'm, I think it's just a wonderful opportunity for our parents to get to know their kids even deeper. And like you said, they're going to be fine. If they don't make pre-K, it's okay. If, if ninth grade is a, a wash, I promise they're going to be okay. And I think, I think they need to hear that because what, what is most valuable is the connection and that relationship stays intact. Because if it doesn't, that's, it's, it's, a, it's really bad. <laughs> so thank you for saying that to our families. Um, really appreciate that. Lastly, in closing, Kay, I know we have all heard that our joy comes from knowing Jesus, from loving him, from his word. What gives you just a daily, like for me, it's silly. I look outside and I see the birds and our little bird seed that we just start and it makes, it gives me joy. It's something as silly as that, you know? So what are some things? Who knew that you were a bird lady, Jeanette? I'm a, <laughs> right? bird, lady. Yes, I'm a bird lady. I'm pretty, I'm pretty oh. ridiculous about it. I have right behind me, I have... I didn't know, I didn't know you were going to say that, but I have my bird book and my binoculars right there. So I am a bird lady too. Um, yeah, it is. And so I do, I love, I love watching birds. I don't want to own one because they're dirty and messy, but I want to look at them and I want to enjoy them through my little binoculars. And um, I may be one of those really weird older ladies someday that you see in the national parks with the, you know, the gigantic <laughs> Uh, magnifying glass. Um, but I also like, I know this is weird. Nature, I guess the answer to that is nature. I don't have to climb the mountain to, to find it beautiful. I can look at Saddleback Mountain out my window here and get just as much pleasure as, as climbing it. So I don't have to actually do some of those things as um, I'm more of an observer, but I love it. And just tonight before I came in, I mean, the ants have decided that this is now it's the ants have finally invaded my house. And um, every summer they come, and I was thinking maybe this summer I was gonna, I was gonna escape them because they usually come in <laughs> August. But oh no, they are here. There's even now are all around my house are ant traps. So outside, I was looking um, right before I came in. And there was this huge, um, and I I had put down a, a trap, and it, it's a liquid, and some of it spilled out. I didn't mean to, but it spilled out, and instantly the ants swarmed over this liquid ant bait, and I just kind of sat down and was like this. <laughs> And I'm watching the ants and I'm thinking, you are so weird, Kay Warren. But but it I could get lost. I love it. Some people, you know, it's 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 cooking, it's needlework, it's a sport, it's a hobby, it's working out, it's um, painting, it's you know, it's whatever. But really for me, probably it on a daily basis. It is nature. It is God's art. Nature. God's world. That's that's so cool. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for being here. Honestly, Kay, just it's been such a joy to talk with you and to hear your heart. You're always such a blessing to us when we get to hear from you directly. You're so authentic and real, and I just love and appreciate you so much. So thank you so much for being here. So big hugs and kisses to all your mamas and Pastor Chris. <laughs> thank you, Kay. Thank you. Kay. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I hope you were blessed by that as much as I was. Um, I know you were, I've seen, was scrolling through some of your faces and I know we're just all feeling the same um, about just being isolated and alone. And part of why we did this was to launch our Parent Connect ministry. Um, and so we don't want you to be alone. We don't want you to feel isolated. Um, yes, we have to get creative. Yes, it may be on Zoom or a small little coffee dates, but we are here together. We are better together. Um, I promise you, the more that you get out and you start sharing and talking, you're going to just, it's kind of like she talked about Frodo, like think of a glass of water, you hold it and it's not really, you know, it's not heavy, but the longer you keep holding the burden and holding it and holding it, your arm's going to get tired after a while. So we want to be with you. We want to partner with you so that way you can, you can feel loved and supported. Good night, everybody.